Uh, great. So, uh, so far in the class, we talk about motivation for data science. Even nowadays that ChatGPT exists, we talk about the tools, fundamentals, probability theory, uh, graph algorithms, basic stats, and basic machine learning. These are some of the things. And in particular, we talk about auto, uh, Amazon AutoGluon that you can just go there. You can just write, uh, give you your data using that. It may take time, but it find the right model for ML and some optimization for hyperparameters like the, for example, all this uh, machine learning algorithm using trees like random forest or I don't know, uh, XGBoost or others. They have the number of trees the depths of trees, et cetera. These are some of the hyperparameters this is called that it should be essentially uh, optimized. And lots of them can be done by Amazon Autogluon at the beginning. Then you can, of course, then manipulate a bit more and work with it, play with it such that you can get the optimal. That's the whole idea. And that's a, that's a current uh, a standard in industry. Good. Uh, okay. So uh, given that uh, now the main question that where do you want to get the data? So you want to essentially okay. have some website and others. Is it the way actually, by the way, lots of startups are doing, lots of startups, especially in the past, uh, they just, the, the thing that they were doing, they were just scraping the web or they get the data from somewhere else and then sell this data. And they, some of them even, they didn't need to raise that much money because they had the customers some of the special uh, set of startup in these areas were essentially those that, for example, working for energy or energy prices. They just got it from different sources like Texas, in California, et cetera. They got all the things and then they are selling it to the others. And they get the money. Because this is some of the things that the people don't want to just do it themselves. If you want to work on the energy side or other things, you don't, they don't want to, if you want to have a startup like optimizing on the energy bidding, et cetera, especially given this kind of solar energies and the way that you can save the energy and then sell and buy to the grid, et cetera. The people don't want to deal with it, the data themselves at the beginning. They just want to use it. So that if there is some startup who has done that, then they will just buy from them. That's a very good source of money. So that's the thing that we are talking more essentially here and in uh, your project that you are considering that. So uh, in this, uh, today class, we talk about this basic ML and such algorithm. Before we talk about data collection and loading. In particular, uh, we talk about uh, querying using a REST or RESTful uh, API or GraphQL. This is all the older version of that. Parsing different types of files, that is also very important. It's a typical files that you are seeing in data science and regular expression that is very useful as well. Uh, I mean, there are lots of use for that when you are working with the data. Then we talk about uh, modeling and manipulating data, but that would be very brief. This session, we will talk more in the future session. But, but first, how can we get the data and how can we handle it? Uh, there are five ways to get the data. One way is to just direct download and load from some local or generally global storage. So there is some data somewhere you will take it as such. These are reasonable generally if you want to just run some algorithm, do some tests. But generally, uh, the value would be less because everyone can just download that data. So there's not much value. <clears throat> So there are another way that you generate locally via some downloadable codes or simulations. So in some sense, you want to generate the data, do it <clears throat> using simulation. This is not also the best things. Why? But what is the whole idea of simulation? You will simulate the data. If you know good things about the data, if you know a distribution of the data, if you, have a, if you know a lot about the data, but if you already know that, then what do you want to learn from this data? So yes, you can do that, but again, you may do it for some particular application, but it's not the main thing. And you can query data from a database. Yes, this database can be, again, some global thing that you can query from that. But even this kind of databases nowadays is more like through 
done through APIs. So the main two approaches that these are the most important one, query an API from in, in, uh, from the intra or internet, essentially. So it can be essentially some kind of local thing that you are doing. And this is the some idea, for example, if you have the Kubernetes, lots of uh, microservices that we will talk about them. There, uh, even uh, these applications, when they want to talk with the, uh, some of the ser microservices, when they want to talk with uh, other microservices that they are doing, for example, getting the data from the database, et cetera, all of them through, was done through database. So even this one generally is done through API nowadays. And of course, the other one that is still very relevant, is scrape data from a web page. That is important. Why? Because there are lots of governmental page, for example, that they have the data, but they don't have an API to get the data. In that case, uh, I mean, there is, a, so in some sense, API is, a, as we talk about, is some kind of language that you design such that the people can get the data from you. But lots of governmental data, for example, governmental web page, they don't have this, they didn't, they didn't design such kind of language yet. So, but they put all the data even daily or something, they upload it in their database. So, in their web pages, etc. So there you need to scrape the web such that you can get the data. And that data is actually very valuable because again, because everyone who wants to use it, especially from large set of resources, they cannot afford to write a program. They can write it, but it takes a lot of time essentially. And they would like that if someone else is essentially presenting this data, have this data, and they can buy it. And generally, the way that they are buying, they buying, so you should have a website that essentially like, so there here, uh, here you have a server, and this server is through API, provide this data that you say, for example, you scrape the data from the web page, we can sell it to others. And the general idea is that, I mean, for like a few API calls, you don't charge, after that you are charging. That's a typical model that the people, Whenever they have a data, they want to sell it, that's the way that they are. Doing. So API is somehow also used to charge people. And this is like almost everywhere, and like even at Google and others, according to the API calls, and they, for different calls, they may have a different price. What is API? So API essentially is a web-based application programming interface. And it is essentially a contract between a server and the user. So, and this is the idea. It says that if you send me a specific request, the server says that to the user. So this is uh, from server to user. So it's that if you send me a specific request, I will return some information in a structured and documented format. So this is essentially the somehow the language between a server and the user. I mean, there are some web-based things, but uh, this is a. Uh, they are much more general. They can do lots of other stuff. As I mentioned, it can be between two different processors. It can be a bit between two microservices, essentially, between two applications, uh, in, even in different OS, essentially. Uh, they can uh, communicate. So if two programs want to communicate, they are communicating through API. So uh, let me tell you a little bit more about it. So what is the idea? This is a very natural idea. So if you are doing essentially it's called imperative coding, then I mean you will get some input file. For example, if you are something you are working some network or some graph, you will read your input or your graph from input.txt. You will do some computations. This computation is essentially your code. And then at the end, you are doing it at say output.txt. Correct? You will do some calculation and you are outputting your solution. That's a typical way of I mean, writing the code essentially. Like with C, Python, or others. Here, this is the idea. So, to make this one a bit more general, essentially, we are doing that. We are doing this one through an API call. 
API call, this is exactly, this is application programming interface. So what do I do? I generally give the inputs.txt to some programs through a web protocol that we discussed. Then that is doing some calculations and then returns me some output. Good. That's essentially the general idea that will be used uh, 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 essentially through the web. And the good thing is that this is independent of like, for example, uh, this operating system or different application, even different, it can be different, totally different languages. As long as we have a contract, that's it, these are the inputs. This is the input.txt according to this format. And then uh, this is the output format, then, I mean, you just give the input that takes some time and then takes essentially some. So, uh, lots of essentially the web-based API will be done through HTTP requests. And what are these requests? So you will say, the, one of the most simplest one is get. So you say request get, then uh, this is the website. And then there is some authentication that you may or may not need it, like as a user pass. This is more like the older style, essentially. And uh, we will talk about more newer stuff, essentially. But this is uh, also, then you can get uh, r.status.code. Uh, Generally, if you get 200 or 400, that means successful things. Uh, otherwise, you, if it's two or two of one or some other four of one or something like this, it means that there's an error. And here, uh, the headers, uh, you can say the content type. The content type essentially says that this is an application, and it may say the it is uh, the the way the standard essentially to give some of this data and get it, especially to get it, would be the JSON file that we will talk about. So then you will say r.json, and then it provides essentially in a dictionary way uh, the output for you. We will talk about JSON for it. Good. So, uh, I mean, this is this is another one that you can do. I mean, if you can uh, generally, for example, if you want to, uh, uh, to get to get the data, you can essentially use this one. You just type the whole thing. Or you may do it actually through the get. When you get through the get, generally this other stuff, these are the parameters that you are giving. So this parameter is nothing than the input essentially. So you can think about if the parameters, essentially it, like it, it is like in the form of dictionary. You say the parameter Q, the value is this, the parameter TBS, the value is this. You will do that, then you will get from the website, and then you will say params equal to parameters. That's exactly the input file that you are giving. Good. And then it returns some file. Again, it's some kind of, uh, it is a combination of dictionary and arrays, which is a JSON file. It returns to you, and it can be a larger thing, essentially, large data. You will get the data, and you can do the process. So here, I mean, this is said that, I mean, we are querying the web, uh, essentially web API, but you can do actually more than that. These are, uh, uh, this API essentially, or RESTful APIs, it is based on uh, this fact that, I, I mean, uh, essentially RESTful stands for Representational State Transfer APIs. And there are a few uh, instructions that you can get. So again, so this is a, this is the user or any program essentially. User means I mean your user program, I would say. Then you are talking with a server, and this is the server that you may write it essentially. So you will write the server, and then uh, this uh, user uh, sends some request. One of these essentially instruction. These are like some kind of more global things. 
but each of them have their own parameters. And this parameter, what are the parameters is the one that server decides about. Server, and generally, if you search about API, they are talking about the different instruction that they have it. You can do one of these instructions. And according to that, you will get some answers. For example, you can do it with the, your banks. Generally have it for, if you work for some of these stock trading company, they have it, or like Coinbase has it. All of them have it. So these are the typical uh, instruction that will be used. Get. You generally perform a query and you will get a return data. That is the general. So you want to ask something, you will do that. You may do post. Post essentially creates a new entry or object for you. So you want to add a new, for example, record, a new bank account, everything you can do it with post. You can do use put, update an existing entry or object. Or you may do delete, that delete an existing entry or object. You can see this entry or object is something in your database in general that you can do it or anything else. And of course, it can be more intricate. However, the, one of the two most important ones essentially are get and post. In general, post essentially. Not that at the end of the day, the people, this is mainly, these are some typical line things that you will see it in different servers. And this is, again, you may, if you want to delete some entries because you are interacting with that server essentially. And you may delete some entry or anything essentially. You may use one of these things, get, post, put, or delete. This is, again, some standard one. But at the end of the day, everything can be done with just one of them. Why? Because at the end of the day, you, you only need to call this one. You can call it get, post, put, anything. You will give some parameters. These parameters are the input. Part of the parameters can be actually, say, if you want to delete, put that parameter, essentially, delete equal to true. It deletes for you, essentially. Or you want to update it, say, parameter update equal to true. Otherwise, it would be false. So essentially, you can do all of this operation just with post. And post is one of the most uh, important one that you can do it. Post has one other property that you can essentially, they call it long call. You can essentially say, you, will, you can specify waiting time. So you would say that I will send this one, I will wait. And I will wait to get my answer this, uh, like I don't know, this millisecond, 20 millisecond or 120 millisecond. And if I get it within this time, then it is fine. Otherwise, it gives an error or some standard. So in that sense, post is very important because of this kind of, it's called long count. Good. Uh, did you say long call? Long call. You will call it, but long because it, you can essentially spend more. So, these are uh, a few things that I wanted to mention. Uh, good. All of these kind of restful things is based on this idea of stateless. So this is based on the concept of a stateless architecture, or they will call it restful stateless architecture. What's the meaning of that? That's very important. So here you understand from a user, a program that a user has written it, you can interact with it. And as I mentioned, there are several options that you have. Now I want to go behind the scene. What's the meaning of behind the scene? I want to go and talk about the server. Because in some sense, any program that you will write, you may get the data as a user, and then you may sell it as a server. So this is very important. I mean, this concept actually took me some time, some maybe actually six, seven months to understand. So uh, this concept of a stateful versus a stateless that we are talking about. 
Whoever that you are interacting with, this can be a stateful <clears throat> or a stateless. These kind of restful APIs are mainly for a stateless architecture or a stateless design. Let me give you an example. So you will go essentially to a bank. Good. So there are two options when you go to the bank. Sometimes you will go to the teller or say ATM, or sometimes you will go to the customer service. I don't know, like sometimes we call it via VIP or other things. Or it's like some associate, I will say. Maybe this one is also called associate. What is the difference? When you go to teller or to the ATM, generally you will give this your ID. You need to verify. This verification, it is something that we will talk about, and this would be something like generally the most like the current state of the art is OAuth, or sometimes called uh, OAuth, or they will just call it OSSH. This is a technology that we will talk about it, and I think OS2, we believe it's a latest version maybe three years but but this is the OS technology so that's essentially for authentication you authenticate yourself then you do a simple transaction what you get some money you put some money etc and then you are done generally you cannot do several of the things or if you want to even do several of the things, you will go to Bank of America, for example, then say, oh, sorry, if I say, oh, I, what the way, I wanted to do another thing. The people behind you might be not very happy that you are doing several of this. But other than that, also that teller says that, sir, you need to essentially put your card again for the next time. This is the concept which is called a stateless. What's the meaning of that? Mean that this person, you authenticate, you will do some transactions and done. You want to do another thing, send another authentication. This is exactly the way that this kind of get, post, put, and delete, this type of RESTful API are working. At any time, you need to authenticate, do a simple transaction, and then done. You want to do more, send another application. Versus the case that you will go to customer service or more generally like associate, that you will sit in the bank, someone comes for you and say, do you need a coffee or something? Yes, yes I want some coffee. And then they say, okay, let's go to my room. You will go to the room, your identity, again, still authenticate you. But then you may work essentially for one hour with the person. I want to open this. They say, okay, we have some other extra credit card. Do you want to apply for it? And then you, but not each time you are essentially authenticate yourself. This would be something called a stateful. So you see the difference between these two things. A stateless, authenticate, do the job, that's it. A stateful, no, you authenticate, then you will talk essentially for a long time. Even if you may continue after that over email or over phone, etc., because that person knows you, uh, especially if you have the money. So they will be very happy to call you again and communicate with you. That would be the stateful example. Good. Now, what's the meaning of it? So this is, a, so, so far everything that we talk about essentially is talking about the RESTful APIs. There are, a, or a stateless architecture. What is the, there is another one which it is a stateful, a stateful essential technology. For example, if you use socket IO or others, there are some of these. That is our bidirectional. So here we have bidirectional. <clears throat> uh, essentially, a uh, bidirectional long uh, transactions.
what's the meaning of that? It means that this kind of bidirectional long transactions, you may actually interact with this uh, program for a long time. A good example, when you play the game. So when you play the game, you're playing game with another person. Uh, in some sense, you want a server that you just constantly communicate that, I don't know, for 30 minutes. Essentially. While here, probably the, in the API, the most that you can give it, you can do it with post, and you can say how long it waits. But generally, even the post, you don't wait that much. Essentially. Well, as I mentioned, you may play one hour, essentially, even more than that. Hopefully not more than that. Don't waste your time with games. But you may do that, essentially. So this is something like uh, these are some technology that was considered for long since. And that was essentially the people design such kind of architecture. Now, what is the benefit of a stateful versus a stateless? In the stateful, as I mentioned, you just communicate once, then you don't have the overhead that every time you just uh, like communicate with that server and authenticate, etc. And more than that, why we call it a stateful? Because the server keeps your current status. Good. So for example, if you are in a game, it knows everything about you. Where is exactly your place in the game? How much, I don't know, blood you have? What, I mean, what is your score? Who are the companies? All of them essentially are kept. So it has a, a lot of state essentially about you. In the state list, the, this teller essentially, or ATM, does not keep any information about you. You want to do anything else? Okay, just uh, give me again the information and authenticate again. So uh, in the stateful case, there is much less overhead. However, why do we use a stateless then? A stateless is super scalable. A scalability is the main thing for a state, essentially a state. Interestingly, there are some of these protocols that are written, as I mentioned, for a stateful things like socket IO, et cetera. But interestingly, if you go there nowadays, almost everything on the web are actually based on the stateless things. So what's the meaning of that? Even how you think that you are communicating with some technology that is written essentially as a, a stateful, but they have been written themselves in terms of a state. So in some sense, some simulations that you don't see, you see that it's bidirectional, but everything actually has been done in terms of a state. So uh, uh, there maybe there were some previous technology were not like that, but this is the current thing that, and of course the internet became much faster. This overhead is not the biggest things. And so this stateful in some sense is a simulation of a stateful mechanism nowadays, but based on a stateless. So if you write some of this, for example, socket IO or other thing that you are using, these are bidirectional thing. If you go to your Google, for example, if you put it on your Google app engine, the cloud, G cloud, then if you go there, you see all these commands are still post, get, put, etc. So they currently they are simulated a stateful in terms of a stateless. Now, why uh, again? Why this is important? This scalability is super. Uh, why it is important? Because just think about that. You will write some app. Then I don't know for ten people. Then all of a sudden the website essentially comes. Ten thousand people are connecting to your website. It's very. This is the thing that happened actually with ChatGPT. I think after that happens for trends. Uh, for uh, Facebook, etc. These are some of the apps, very popular app. Now, <clears throat> the catch is that you want to have a scalable thing. You don't want to write it for 10 if there are, I don't know, 100 people. They say, oh, you know, this is a typical thing that happens if you go to some of these governmental website or I don't know, some of the UMD web things. Too many people are connecting, so it gives the 401 error. It never answers. Why? Because they have not written in a modern way. In a modern way, you are writing essentially everything based on a stateless. Now, 
then this stateless especially works uh, so essentially stateless plus cloud essentially result in scalability. What's the meaning of that? For example, you can have a Google app engine or you can actually do this one based essentially based on Kubernetes, etc. That is a technology that is uh, essentially based on this kind of somehow restful or very connected to that at least. When you have a stateless and you have cloud, then you have everything. Why? Because you just put your application on, which is a stateless on the cloud. Now, the number of uh, essentially uh, uh, people are increasing. Then what will happen, for example, Google App Engine is like more abstract way, but you can also do it in like in Kubernetes, et cetera. And you will specify, you say that, okay, I can increase the number of my program, parallel version of my program up to 10. Currently is one because I don't have that many users, but there are more users, increase it to 10. And of course, when you increase it to 10, then you will pay for each of them. You need to be careful. Don't put just 10. Uh, but the good thing is that uh, you will put this one and then you will say up to 10. Up to 10 app, if there are more things, there are, instead of essentially think about this one, you have one teller as your program. And now there are more customers. I have 10 tellers because I have specified that and if there are not 10 tellers, then this program will be died. Essentially, it will be uh, just killed. This program will be killed. And again, you will come back to the one scenario. So if for a while there is not much traffic, automatically these things that program that you had it, they will essentially turn off. And then you have only one thing that you are doing. It. So that, that was exactly the concept of cloud computing. In the cloud computing, we consider essentially computing as a service that you could rent it. So if you have lots of customers, then open lots of <laughs> servers. And of course, generally, if you have lots of customers, it means that you can get more money because of ad more advertisement or any other things, essentially. Or these people, they are paying subscriptions, anything, they are giving more money to it. If you don't have that many things, just turn off them. Just maybe have one server. Don't pay that much. That we can do it because of this stateless property. Why? Because now, uh, if if it was a stateful, now, if all of these people are connected to this, now there are lots of delays. And I cannot easily move my program from this to other because all the state is somehow preserved in this program. But now it doesn't matter. Uh, anyone can answer your question. Like, yes, I mean, even the next call, so I called, I, where before I was talking, for example, this user is talking with this particular app or this, I mean, app station. Then uh, there are more users are coming, the more traffic. Then I open essentially another copy of this app. And then this user for the next things, it goes and talk with that. Because this is a stateless, this particular app didn't keep any information about you. So you need to initiate everything from the beginning. Yes, there is overhead, but at the same time, it means that this other person is also can do your job. Or even there might be some issues with this app. It may be, I mean, essentially, uh, you know, it just locks essentially or hangs or something like this. Doesn't matter. Next time you will go to the, ne the next app. Another app will come and you will go there. Too. So this is a beautiful actually architecture that when you write this one, then uh, you can actually do it lots of scalability. That's the modern way of writing application. And, now, this is also closely related to this concept of essentially Kubernetes. And the concept of uh, uh, microservices that we talked before. So we talk about in the Kubernetes and we mentioned that, okay, this is the idea of the container. A container in some sense is a particular, I mean, there are different names, but they generally you can consider it like one copy of your program that you will put it there. And here, uh, there is some form, it is called a uh, Tara, mm, not Tara forms, I think. It's Tara forms, I think that's the thing. You will specify in a text file that like, for example, how many copies of this app should I have or this program should I have? 
or this container or anything or microservice that I can have. You will and say how much it, it, uh, how much uh, memory I should spend to that, uh, like dedicate to that. Lots of other things you will do it in some kind of set up file in the Terraform that you are just writing there, and you will essentially give that forms everything to the cloud generally. Like for example, you can do it at G Cloud and you can do it or like at you know, AWS. These are like the I mean you can do it Azure as well, but I think. These are also specifically GCloud is very good in these technical things. Now, what is the concept of microservice? The concept of microservice, it, this is essentially come because of this kind of stateless. Means that when you do a stateless, you should not every operation that you will do it, you should authenticate, do some small operations and go. So in some sense, these programs, the apps that you have, these are not very powerful apps. These are small, small apps that each of them is very fast. Get something, do a little bit of computations. So they will get, uh, generally, there is uh, this thing that is coming to here, something. Is this some input? A little bit of computations, a little bit. And in particular, probably access to database. And then what? Then output. Why? Because again, this is the whole concept. So in a, this concept of essentially Kubernetes come from this thing that you have lots of microservices, essentially, small, small things. If you want to, if you want to do a very complicated things, you need to break down your whole things into a small functions in some sense, or a small service. Why? Because each of them now, it is very scalable. If there are more needs for them, then you will say, okay, replicate this one, add 10 more of this. But this is completely different from this kind of like writing imperative, uh, like programming and other that you have just one program. Sometimes you will do parallel things here, but here is doing more distributed way. Lots of small, small programs that all of them should work essentially uh, seamlessly together. Whenever there are more traffic for them, by default, you have already mentioned is this kind of Terraform. Is, okay, if there are more traffic for this one, increase the number of things. And you will put some limit. Maybe you don't want to go too many. So this is essentially, again, a beautiful architecture that like I was starting writing this, oh, maybe I, for this one, I need to this kind of socket IO or this kind of state school. It seems more like maybe at the beginning, it seems more interesting, easier to write. But at the end of the day, the way that you should write it, the modern way is stateless. And then you will do that again, these microservices, you have a small, small things. And when you do this one, as I mentioned, the, the, essentially the post is the one that gives you a, uh, so this is this is specific specifies waiting time essentially. That's the best one that you have. So you have some limitations, a small limitations for com computation. You should get the answer during this short time. If you don't get it, then it gives an error. Now, say uh, now now you see it just I want to give a little bit more detail. So how can we write? Sometimes I need a very essentially long computations essentially, correct? For example, uh, I may want to use Google Maps and it takes a lot of time essentially to compute the best way essentially. But how can essentially this can be done essentially if there's so much computation? The main idea is that, and this is again come from the web. So if you do go to Google, if you search things, or you want to do the Google map. It takes, I don't know, two minutes to break there, then that nobody will use that <laughs> website anymore because it is a broken website. The general idea now also with this kind of microservices, these are something that is called dynamic algorithms. What is this dynamic algorithm? 
algorithm, in general, they try to say that you want to do any calculations, you should do these calculations uh, essentially by doing pre-processing. So if you go to Google Map, Google Map is not allowed that when you do something, is doing all calculations for you at that time because that takes forever. I mean, you, you may want to go from here to California. How come you can't go from here to here? It needs to compute the whole path essentially, consider traffic is everything. Things cannot be computed in last, I don't know, 20 seconds, 20 milliseconds that you will get the answer. All of them are pre processed. So, what is the meaning of that? It means that all of this data that you have it, all of this computation should be pre processed and kept in some database. So there are lots of databases. When you make do a query, essentially it just put together very fast from this pre-processed data some paths for you that say, okay, you will if you want to go from here to California, maybe from here, I don't know, go first to I-70, for example, and then from there I-70 we know the path, and then from I-70 I will go there. There are some kinds of small, small modules that Almost all your answer that you will get it, it will be done through querying data database. In particular, I mean, Google has two important things. It is called a big table and big query. This big table, especially, I mean, these are very fast databases that they have. It. They have prepared first for themselves, but now everyone can use it at GCloud. So for this big table and big query, essentially, you can do like huge databases, you can query them very fast. So almost all things that you are doing, when you do compute my path from here to California, you really, Google does not compute this one for you. Google just has some uh, essentially query to some databases, put the result of a few databases which are very fast and then just give it to you. That's the only way that Google can do this one fast. Otherwise, it takes essentially, I mean, <laughs> forever to get the result. Good. Now, this is the question. How come uh, this is, uh, I mean, you will see it's quite updated, actually. It considers the traffic of these things. How come you can do that? Because this is online. You cannot just uh, pre-process. Like, if one hour ago I computed the traffic of this uh, particular route, and then I use that one. Maybe there was a traffic at one hour ago, but there is no traffic now. So then everything would be wrong, essentially. The idea, this is again the beautiful word I just give you the idea, because this takes I me mean, a lot of time. I mean, if you don't know about this, it may take a lot of time to understand how you should, this big system essentially works. And this actually took for me quite a bit to understand it. It's not written also. I mean, I couldn't find that clearly, essentially, written somewhere, essentially. But this is now, as a, I will say that because I have worked with these companies, I know the, how they are working. So then the, what is the beauty? This is the case. You need to, uh, for this one, this is, again, based on the concept of microservices. What's the meaning of microservices? It means that, OK, I want to go from here to California. Whenever a user says that, Google map, find the path, I will go and query some database. But these queries themselves should be very up to date. Good. So it means that the route from here to I I I 70, there should be some other microservices, some other processes that they are updating the database on the background. Good. So there are some microservices that on the background, they are updating that uh, database. This is the thing that it is a two uh, essentially thing that is used here quite a bit. Uh, essentially one is the, um, yeah. So it is called subpop. Or this is something also called Kafka. These are the two other technology that is used essentially for this one. This subpop and Kafka, these are the way that essentially these are some kind of schedulers. 
this subpop especially is, for example, for Jikla. And the Kafka is a general thing, but if you use Jikla, you can actually use subpop. These are some of the things that, I mean, there is also Airflow and other things, but generally, or Argo essentially, these are this, uh, these are, you need some schedulers. What are the job of this scheduler? The schedulers are doing this. Is it that I start a process, a micro process, that once a while, like very frequently, updates the best path from, I don't know, College Park to I-70. This in the background, this is very small things. And once a while it starts, compute it, put it on the database, and then it will be gone. And this was essentially this kind of scheduler and the top pop are the thing. So you can essentially do that whenever a new, uh, so you can say this one, for example, generate every, I don't know, one second, start one of this process, compute it, and then when you are done, it will be killed essentially. It will be so this is essentially the beautiful architecture that you have. You will see completely distributed thing. It's not very complicated, actually. This is like, you may like ChatGPT and the way like the LLMs and others are working, but this is also very beautiful design. This one is not that much. I mean, I have not seen that many of this with all descriptions anywhere, essentially. These are like more the experience that I have done it. I have, and they spent, I mean, quite a bit of time in the wrong way to understand the correct way, essentially. And my experience is this big company. This is the whole architecture that you are doing. So the whole architecture is that everything is the distributed thing. Do you think that you are talking this compute for you? But it's not the case that it computes for you. There are some other processes that they are computing this one, updating the database. You will just query the database and get it. Otherwise, again, as I mentioned, you cannot get the, uh, when you search for a path from here to here in a very short time. That is impossible. So this is this is the whole idea, and uh, uh, and this is exactly this. This is the point that I mentioned. These programs that I have mentioned, these are somehow based on this kind concept of state less things. That this is just very small program. Just do it. Starts compute the best path from here to I two seventy, I like I seventy for example, and then it will be key. Very small program. But there are tons of these programs that they are doing all over the time at different times in the distributed way, such that you will get it. So this is like something like behind the scene. You may see like Google is doing this one, but behind the scene, when you have a deep dive, see, oh, these are like, this is a different word. These are words of different programs that they are working in a seamless way such that they compute this thing. Uh, and this is, I mean, another good example for that. Essentially, you can see the transportation thing. Just think about this. Like, we, this is actually, I think this uh, goes, this credit goes to Michael Jordan. He's actually not the uh, famous basketballist. Uh, I think he's actually a famous professor at uh, University of California at Berkeley. Uh, and he's working in machine learning. And he said that if the people essentially just see the way that in US, all the components are coming at any time and you will get everything that you want. You will order Amazon, you will get the food, everything. All of them behind the scenes, something complicated like this essentially is going on. And you may take it for granted, oh, this should be done, but you just think about COVID. You see, when COVID came, a little bit of this network was essentially had the issues or like some people essentially left due to COVID a little bit things now, still we have this problem. Still, for example, if you want to get a dishwasher, I don't know, washer or something, some electronic thing, it takes a long time for the cars. Why? Because that network essentially had some issues in it, some delays the, that some of these providers are not I mean, fast or essentially the transportation is not fast. The same thing here. It's a very complicated thing that is going on, such that you will get this simple thing that you will search from here to this. You will take it for granted, but the huge word is in the back of this, such that you can get this thing. And that's the only way that you can write it down. Why? Because of scalability. That's the only way that you can write, such that you can scale it at, at any level that you want. At night, not too many people maybe are using it night here, maybe of course, like and the US, maybe the night the US, the people don't use it that much. All these programs, now it will be less updated, less updates 
All of this essentially turn off, such that the cost is that much. Again, in the morning, it starts, all of them turn on, and they are working for you, such that you will get this with us. And this is the way of, this is a different way of thinking about writing this program. Anyhow, so that's the thing that I wanted to mention about this idea. If we talk about a stateless, then uh, this is also about something that I wanted to say about uh, this kind of uh, uh, OAuth or OAuth. This is essentially uh, this is a state of the art for authentication. Uh, let me mention any now anything that will go, it should authenticate. And this authentication, before it was maybe this user password, but nowadays essentially it's based on this concept of OAuth, and it is change essentially. The whole idea is this one, that generally to be very secure, this, for example, if you want to uh, use the API to talk with your bank, do some transaction, or you want to start trade stock or crypto, etc., you need to do that. Generally, this, uh, there is something that is called an app key. First, you need to go essentially, generally, there are several levels of security. This is something called app key that you need to go and get from this thing. You need to register that I want to use some of my application. I have some app that is doing a stock trading. I want to talk with my bank, essentially, or like uh, the one that uh, essentially the banks or any agency that provide the capability to do trades, such as over the internet. You need to register and get some app key. Then from this app key, you need to at any time, again, still you need to log in. The same way that you log in to your bank, essentially. Generally, then, and the login generally can be, I mean, you need to do it uh, yourself, essentially, log in. And nowadays, you know that this is the thing that is a standard now, that you will log in. You say, okay, I will send you a code through an email or your cell phone. When you do that behind the scene, it gives you some access token. When you do that, when you authenticate, this is the access token that you have. This access token will be there, say, it depends for different things. It might be the case for 90 days. Now, during these 90 days, before ending the 90 days, you don't need to, again, this app, like, you don't want every 90 days you need to log in. You will do it once, log in. Before the 90 days, with the current access token, you can ask for the new access token. Sometimes they are doing in two levels, not only one access token, there is a temporary access token as well. They may call it different thing. So this is the temp access token. What is this temp access token? This access token that you have it is for 90 days. But to do essentially the transaction, you need the temp access token. This temp access token is essentially valid for say 90 minutes. So this, is, this works only for 90 minutes. Now, what's the meaning of that? The general idea is that before 90 minutes ends, you need to have your access token valid. Your temporary current temporary access token valid, such that you can get a new temporary access token. Then again, it's valid for ninety days and nineteen minutes. And then before your uh, access, current access token becomes invalid in ninety days, like it, while it is active, you need to get a new access token as well. Sometimes they don't have the temporary access token; just they have access token. But sometimes they have the two level. What is the idea? So this is all for essentially authentications. So whenever you want to call this app, how do you authenticate when you, through API? You will essentially uh, authenticate by giving this parameter. One of them is access token, and you need to give your token. This is essentially some long code that you need to give. It's generally, they are using the RSA or other technologies, crypto essentially, for giving this token, such that you cannot essentially hack it. But these are different, these are extra levels of security that you will add on top of that. Why? Because you want to make sure that if you have an app key, okay, you can do it. But the issue is that why they are putting this one, all of them have some kind of limited in time because they want that if some app is working continuously, it seems that, okay, that is the correct way that is working that. But the case that if the app does not work for 90 days 
and then start working. It might be the case that your laptop is essentially stolen. Somebody got essentially has stolen this one. And then, for example, if this, again, your laptop is working this 90 minute case essentially. If for 90 minutes it is stolen, and then someone else tried to use your bank account to do some transaction. But during this time, I mean, it was off or something like this because it was stolen, took some time essentially to go there. Then that does not work anymore. So, that, okay, sorry, it does not, the access token does not work. 90 minutes is essentially passed. You need to get another new access token such that you can have access to that. So, even your laptop might be stolen and go there. Then the laptop with the same program does not work anymore. Or if sometimes if you change the IP also does not work. So they put that as long as it is some kind of a stable situation, you put it your laptop essentially at your home or your server. You can interacting and doing some transactions, like for example, with the banks, I don't know, it's a stock trade or coin, like essentially Bitcoin, et cetera. That is fine if you can work. As long as there is some changes, all of this, or there is some delay that no activity, the same thing that like with the bank. If you access to the bank and then you don't uh, do something for, I don't know, 10 seconds or like maybe one minute, then you say it logs out. The same thing, exactly the same thing here. If you don't do it for 90 minutes, it depends. So if it is very things, you may get it for 90 minutes, sometimes even 90 seconds even. You can have a different level to just make sure that if there is some inactivity, just log you out. But as long as it is continuous, it allows you to do that. So the same technology is there. And these are, as I mentioned, different levels to make sure that if you continuously use it, then you can use it without any interruption. As long as there is some interruption, it does not allow you and ask you to get this access token again. There, you need to again go to the website, log in, and then send the code, the code, should, the code should be sent to your cell phone, and then you should authenticate and do that. All of them is because of for your security. And this is, as I mentioned, this is OS uh, 2 or 3, essentially, these are the different version of this, uh, OS, or OS. Both, I have seen that the people, I think. This is the OS technology that essentially you are using for this app. So you need to get app key, you need to get access token, and with that, you can then communicate with your bank, with uh, some of these websites. And that would be part of the input that you need to give it each time such that you can get their data. Good. So that's essentially, I think, covered the very big story. Now, uh, this took me some time. <laughs> I mean, like in the order of a year, maybe years even, to get the whole picture that what's going on. But they try to give it essentially such that you have the idea. Of course, each of them has the more details, but these are the details now you can go and ask chat GPT or some blogs, et cetera, to read it. Because now you will see what is the whole picture. Good. So these are I mean, some of the things, for example, I mean, you can do it. I just give some examples if you want to play with this thing. There are several things like Twitter, for example. Lots of them, again, all, all of them at the beginning, they were not that secure, but nowadays lots of them are secure, for example. GitHub is another one, for example, you can go and do some of these commands essentially. So there are several websites. Almost everything they are, as long as you are doing enough authentication, that takes time. I mean, you need to understand exactly what is the language for authentication, whether there is one level token or two level or three level. If you do this one correctly, then you can essentially communicate with that. But they generally don't want to allow you to do that if you are not authorized. Because as I mentioned, it can be very sensitive thing. So if you have the program to access my bank account, then you can do whatever you want with that. Yeah. What was that? Can you be louder? Yeah, yeah. So, so it, it, it's a complicated thing. I mean, if you understand it, I really actually surprised essentially. <laughs> so I just mentioned, I mean, very, I mean, this is like, I mean, these are the way that I mentioned it very, uh, like, um, like overall architecture of that. Then, I mean, for each of these, I mean, you need to go and, I mean, you can search more about this architecture, how you can essentially write this one in a more distributed way and understand that. But again, this is a very high level that we have described it, and you need to do more research to understand. Just give the very general ideas. Uh, good. 
So this is the authentication and out that I have mentioned, and I have already mentioned this is like the way, for example, uh, I mean, before you could, uh, I mean, essentially give the, I don't know, the user and the password, but uh, now essentially uh, you need to grant an app access, as I mentioned, that is app key that you need to do it. And then you need to get the OAuth, I mean, to get the access token. Both of them, this is the app key. And this access token essentially is the one that gives you the uh, access token essentially to do that. And good. So now that uh, we talk about this, we need to talk about the, so, so far we talk about input. Input essential. So what are the instruction, get, post, put, et cetera? What is the architecture that we are using, a user using? What is the architecture that that server is written essentially? Very high level. Then the issue is the output. The output can be at a different essentially format. And this can be essentially the CSV. This is a typical file. This is a comma separated value. This is like Excel format essentially. It can be JavaScript object notation or JSON that we will talk about it, or it can be HTML, XML, etc. It can be some more like domain specific structures like for geo, a special vector data, you may have shape file, RVT files, or you can make any other format that you want because this is the format you can call it, a, I don't know, the, like for example, you have the CSV files, like I don't know, mm, yeah app.csv or something like this. But you can have app. I don't know, OGV. Just create something and this is the format and this is some language that you that you write as the server, you will tell all of your users, I will return this file with this format and you can use it, whatever. However, having said that, almost this is the common standard nowadays is the JSON. A CSV also is used in some cases if you get the database, but generally the, the most uh, uh, state of the art is JSON files that, that will be returned. We will talk more about it. Uh, good. Just I mean, one thing before going to that is, is this GraphQL. We talk about API. This is uh, like, for example, if this is the case. So if you want to go, for example, at book, you may uh, access essentially to this web page, you may query this particular web page, and then it returns for you in a, this kind of JSON format. JSON, as I mentioned, we will talk more about it, is a combination of JSON, is a uh, combination of dictionaries and arrays. So you can, it returns essentially for you, this is as, but it is also very human readable things. It returns essentially this information. So you, with this book, you will say, what is the title? What is the author? In the GraphQL, this is something that, I mean, this designed by internally used by Facebook, but I mean, it's not very standard. I mean, that maybe Facebook used it, maybe it was I, but there, not only you will say in the GraphQL, you don't say that this is the book ID you will give it, but you could specify also that what is the title and the author, and only you will ask for the first name of the author, not the second name, the last name essentially. And then it, when it returns, it returns to you the title, author, but on the author, it just returns the first name. This is not, I mean, this is, I mean, the people maybe at the beginning, they are doing that, this architecture may be designed by lots of companies and they have their own things. But at the end of the day, this is not much different from the REST API. Why? Because there, essentially, here you can specify in the parameter part. In the parameter, you will say, I want only title and first name of the author, not the second name. So it just returns the one that you need. So you don't need to have a new technology or architecture for that. So RESTful API is the state of the art. And the file that it returns is JSON generally, and JSON is the state of the art for returning this. Okay, so this is the thing that I mentioned, uh, as I mentioned, using APIs are growing rapidly, and especially because of these microservices. And uh, this is the, 
the way that I have already mentioned that, as I mentioned that, even if you have your system, all of these microservices, all of them, how they communicate with each other through API. This, uh, this a small thing that I have mentioned, this a small uh, program microservice, they may talk with a database, all of them through APIs. They may talk with another program, this kind of sub pop things is talking through APIs. Everything is done through APIs. And again, API is nothing, I mean, it's like uh, that uh, complicated, just get the input, do a little bit of computation and return the output. Good. So that's the thing that I have mentioned. And again, if you need longer computation, generally these longer computations is something that you need to do it. You will ask the, the result that you will get it. You can, of course, put post and you can have it like at a two minutes or something, but that generally happens much less. Generally, the case is that you will essentially ask the server, server has some pre-computed things that just return it to you very fast. And at the same time, when you are doing the query, it asks another microservice that say, oh, this is, was needed, please update it. Such that next time that you will contact it, it will be the updated one that you will get back. Anyhow, so we talk about this. Now, uh, like parsing different types of files. So one is the CSV files in Python. So essentially a CSV reader is the one that it can just go and read it. Uh, so uh, like, how can we, uh, what is the format? So for example, this is the CSV file. This is the comma separated file. So 126 January introduction and this comma, and then uh, here to read such kind of, and for each line you have this one. You will say import CSV. You don't need to write your own CSV or JSON parser, it is there. So you will say import CSV, then you will open it. This is the open this file. This is means read in binary. And the name of the file would be F. Then you will say CSV reader, F. Delimiter is comma. Delimiter, it can be comma or anything. It was originally comma, but it can be anything. And then quote character. Quote character is also very important. Here, this is the quote character. If you don't say what is the quote character, so here, for example, dot, this would be, uh, so if we, if we don't say the code character, so default would be just the delimiter, which is comma. So in that case, it would be one field would be PDF. That would be one. And the other one would be, uh, the other one would be PPTX. That would be another thing. But when you put quote, it means that both of them should be considered together. So there is no comma in between. If the comma is, internal in some sense. So you should put this uh, quote character and then essentially this one is uh, something that returns to use this reader would be something like iterator that you can iterate on it, essentially. Now we'll say for each row, uh, if you have iterator, then you can put a for loop for it. Say that for each row in reader, just print the row for me. Uh, if you can use essentially Pandas, pandas also reads the whole thing. You don't need to put this for it, just read the whole file and then put it in a database, and we will talk more about it later. Uh, so this one I will come back to this, uh, but let's talk about the JSON file that we talk about it. So, uh, JSON is essentially a way, it is more than just the output, it's a method for serializing objects. So you have essentially an object. It can be essentially an object in terms of object-oriented thing. It can be very complicated. You want to send this object from one program to another. You need to somehow consider this whole object and then send it to the other. Generally, the way that you will do it, you can convert this object into a string. And this string can be sent essentially over the internet to the other program, and that other program can decentralize it and convert back this string to an object. So if you want, essentially, you have, for example, you have a backend, this is a front end, and you want to communicate, this, this two you want to communicate with each other, the way to do so is to send the information via a string. 
you have done it again. This I have done it myself. I have done it with a string. I say, okay, actually, you can make everything JSON. And then for JSON, there is a standard way that can be essentially sent. You can use the whole JSON file. It is a known, for example, JavaScript knows JSON or Python knows JSON. So you can essentially connect Python to JavaScript by sending JSON file. So JSON is a common format that can be used. First, I mean, if you have some object, you will make essentially JSON out of it, and then you make it a string, and then send the string, and then decentralize, make an object, and then from that object, from that string, from that JSON, you will make the object in another language. So in general, JSON is something which is very easy for human to read and for sanity check edits, and defined by three universal data structures. One is the dictionary. One is the array that I mentioned. And the last one are some kind of basic forms. So a string, float, in, these are some basic things that you have it, that is part of it. And in, it can be a JSON object, and in something, it can be a JSON essentially object recursively. So inside, uh, like one of these arrays, this array can be another JSON. That inside that there is some dictionary and some arrays. So you can essentially, this is some example that you can see it here. So some built-in types for JSON is like a string it understands. This is the numbers, true or false or none. The list and arrays are the same. So the list in some sense is just part of the JSON and dictionaries. For example, you say hello, this is the meaning, I don't know, in French, or goodbye, this is the one in French. So here, this is a JSON file essentially. It can be, it is an array, one, two, and the third thing is a JSON object. What is this JSON? It has a dictionary, help. The value of this dictionary is, uh, but the value of this dictionary is, a, a, is an array. And this array itself, it, uh, so this is an array or list. So this is, the, this is some number. And then the second one is a dictionary. The second element of the array is dictionary. So in some sense, the whole idea is that we have these basic types then you can have an array of them or you can have a dictionary of them. And recursively, you can have a very complicated thing. But the good thing is that when you write it, you can actually read it. As a human, you, you can actually read and understand what's going on. Dictionaries are good because they, they give the values. Like even that parameter that I, we talk about, say that this is the value, this is the, this is the name of the parameter, this is the value. So in that sense, that's a good thing for dictionaries that you are using. But arrays are good because the size can be very large. So if you want to return a very large file, how can you return it? You can return it as an array. Because not everything, every element does not have a name for it. Anyhow, so uh, this is another example. For example, if you do this uh, get HTTP this one from Twitter, I mean, that was for some time ago, probably you need to you know, change from Twitter to X and the, some of this has been changed, but as a result, you will get such a JSON file. So you will get essentially, this is the, you get a dictionary first. This, this is the, the previous character is zero, previous character a string is zero, next character is this, and then there is another uh, dictionary. Then the value of this dictionary is an array or a list. So array and the list and vector, all of them are the same. Then the value of that, so this one has essentially, inside it has, uh, uh, again, a dictionary. So the first element of this array is a dictionary. And so and this is the recursive thing that you can do. Again, you can search more about JSON and see that, but that is the general ideas about JSON. What about parsing JSON in Python? Again, you don't need to write essentially your own thing. It is already there. So here, this is some modules. Here we have the uh, CSV. Here you can just use uh, uh, JSON. You will get this one from the file. Then you will, uh, okay. So when you get this one, you will say from JSON, you will get load S. Uh, what is the load S essentially is doing? Load S, it gets essentially a string. This string is what? 
this string is indeed the one that has been transferred to you. It can be encoded at anything, essentially. It turned into bits and then gave, given to you. Load S means load from a string. S means a string. From a string, create the JSON form. And then this JSON, this data would be a JSON format. Then you can have another thing that essentially from this data, you can get the object. You can have a complicated object from the JSON. You can create actually the object that you want, the object-oriented programming system. But you can also print the data. There are two important things. This is load and load s. Load is doing exactly the same thing, but from a file. So load s is getting from the string. This string, you may get it directly and do it. Or you may read it from a file, the binary file or anything, load. Also, how can you do that? So as I mentioned, a JSON a string, you can create a JSON. And this is the encoding, et cetera. These are some kinds of abstract ways. You don't need to care about how this string has been created, et cetera, how it has been encoded, et cetera. You just get the string, and then you will get the uh, JSON out of it, or from a file. The same thing also, how can you save it? You can do it dump. Dump essentially say that this is the JSON object that you have it. You will put it into some file, or dump as. Dump S is the way that you will just create it as an object and then put it as inside the string. Now, this S string, you will put it there. So that is exactly, again, the same idea. We talk about these different APIs. I've written different programs, different programming languages, different OS. You want to, this microservice want to connect with other microservice talks about API. The same thing here. Uh, this, this microservice want to connect there. It's a complicated thing. It want to send it, this data. How can it send it through the essentially JSON? Then you can make a JSON, and this JSON, you can turn it into a string, and this string will be essentially into 0, 1, and then it will go there, and then it will be somehow encoded here, then it goes through the wire, and then it will be decoded there, and you get the object. And this is, again, interesting that JSON, you have it in Python. You, you have it essentially in JavaScript. I believe you should have it also in C++ and others. So different programs, at the end of the day, they all understand what is the meaning of JSON and you can communicate with each other. First through API, and the, the API is the protocol. What about the data? The data will go through JSON. JSON, I mean, there are other ways that you can do it is XML, XHTML, HTML files, and a string. These are the, some that have been used, especially uh, uh, XML. Uh, XML essentially is a hierarchical markup language. You will, for example, say tag the attribute is value one, and there are some other tags, and then this tag. XML actually is a uh, very similar to dictionary, but and also very similar to JSON. The JSON is somehow new uh, level, a new version of XML. XML itself is a generalization of HTML. HTML is essentially is a very missing. So you will see the HTML. It's very hard to read it. Just go to your bank and then you will go to your Chrome and you can inspect each website. And the inspected bridge the HTML for you. It's horrible to read this. XML is a more a structured way of HTML. And JSON essentially is the next version of XML, essentially. So the people use XML a lot, but nowadays just mainly use, uh, use essentially JSON. Maybe some people still use XML, but JSON is the correct thing in the app. However, HTML are all over the place. So XML is not there, but it's a generalization, but HTMLs are there. All these websites are according to HTML, but HTML is essentially a mess and working with that is the one that uh, we will uh, talk about it. How can we essentially do uh, this uh, HTML stuff? Uh, we will talk about that. So HTML is again very complicated, and it is they, also it is important for HTML when the people write in HTML. Um, the HTML it is the, as I mentioned when you write as you have some kind of backend, and you have a front end. This front end that you have is essentially as the HTML code and JS code essentially JavaScript plus HTML. That will be run by your essentially browser. 
your compiler essentially is the browser, like Chrome, Firefox, or whatever. The issue is that, like, when it, if you write some executable file, exe file or something, you don't see you don't see what is inside because everything is like executable. Still, some viruses or something try to understand it and they will add to that. But generally, you don't see the inside of an uh, executable file. It's very hard. HTML is something that you will write and everyone can see what is inside. So uh, this is essentially the danger. When you write a backend, you are talking with uh, your HTML. Good. Your HTML talks with you. However, there is no guarantee that it is your own HTML that is talking to you. You can think in, at the end of the day that this HTML that is talking to you, it might be completely adversary. It might be a hacker that are talking to you. Because it sees the HTML, it, know, it knows what is the protocol that it talks to you, and it can mimic the same structure and talk to you. So that is very important that this is the way essentially that lots of hacking has happens essentially. You will go there, this is a website. This is, you will go to, I don't know, to Google or your bank. Your bank sends some HTML and JavaScript such that on your browser, you are working with it. But the issue is that a hacker understand what's going on and then try to simulate the same way and get some information that are useful for the hacker. This is the main way that the hacking has happening. Why? Because HTML is in open source. That's everyone can see what it is. There are some ways to make it more essentially harder to read. You can actually use the, there are two, two things essentially for HTML is going on. One is that uh, you want to have the size of HTML and JS code are as small as possible. Why? Because then you want to transfer it to much faster. So then you don't have generally very really long values. You have very small values. And actually, if you have HTML code, the JavaScript code, there are some things that make essentially the size of this much smaller by changing the variable to essentially, like you have one name for it in your program, but it changes it to E, F, something like this. There is no value for that. That makes the things faster, but at the same time, make it harder to read for the hackers such that they will, still it is again, the people can read it because it's open source. But if you have the values and you say exactly what is the meaning of that, they can have a better understanding. It would be better to codify as much as possible, but you cannot codify 100%. So still you may assume that this program that is talking to you, it might be not your HTML. It might be some <clears throat> changed HTML <clears throat> by a hacker or something like this. <clears throat> we will talk about scraping HTML in Python next, uh, but I wanted to just finish one thing else also about this Python binding. This is also important. So this is uh, this is the one we talk about NumPy, for example, or uh, essentially uh, SciPy and other things. So these are the uh, lots of things in Python are written actually in C plus. And so as we talk about that, I mean, through API, a Python program can talk with a C++ program. But there are some other ways, but like actually the Python, the lots of these things like pandas, everything are written, written in C++. Why? Because the Python, for example, the for loop in Python is very slow. Like maybe if you want to do the same for loop in C++, it's 50 times faster than Python. It's a huge thing. So, but Python is very easy to use, essentially. That's the reason that this, lots of these Python essentially are written in C++. And generally, this is the concept of binding. That a Python program and the C++ program, they can bind to each other. This is done through Cyton, essentially. And this is the code, actually, my son, Ilya, has written it. So I'm just <laughs> giving the credit for him. So, idea. So you may have some program uh, like C++, uh, Python is very good at reading the files and lots of maybe, because otherwise if you want to read a file and essentially understand it, it might be quite uh, complicated and you need to do a lot of error checks and etc. But Python has all of this. There are packages that they are reading CSV file, parsing HTML, parsing JSON, etc. But C++ is very good at, at uh, essentially 
doing some process, like some of this uh, code writing very efficiently and very fast. So you may bind this one together. This is an example. Say, for example, here, you want to write a program. This is a C++ program. It is a multi-HPP. So this is the one that, it, this is the function that gets two strings, and then essentially output the strings, and then essentially concatenate them and return. So this is the Python, this is the, the essentially a C++ program. It can do much more complicated things. And again, this is very important. This, what is the input? The best way to communicate between two programs is always a string. That's the thing that even between two different programs, we are just using a string. So you may take the string. It might be this string actually is a number, but then you will get the string. You will turn it into a number. You will do it yourself because a string is the most standard way to communicate. Then here, this is these two actually are the same thing, but here this is the setup thing. Setup pi is the one that connects this Python to C++. How does it do? It says that, okay, so here I'm using essentially from libcpp a string, I will get these strings. I mean, uh, from this, uh, this is the one cdef, this is external. It means that from the C++ multi hop file, Essentially, I'm importing this CPP test function. Then I define a new function test xy. What does it do? This test xy is using CPP test inside. CPP test essentially, this is the way. So it gets the input x here. It needs to encode it into the correct strings. So it gets essentially, this is the way to encode it into a string that C can understand it. So it gets your input X in Python, the string in Python. Change it to the some string that C++ understands it, and then uh, call this CPP test to concatenate this. And at the end is doing some decoding. Decoding, such as essentially you can think about this one. This is the Python language. Even the string here is different, but it is more a standard. I will change this one to the some standard way that C++ understands it, bytes. <clears throat> I will give it to C++, C++ concatenate and returns me an string. That string again needs to be decoded to, such that it is coming into the Python language. And then you can essentially, you can use this command, this Python, these things, if you have a Python and Python installed, and then you will use this one, then you can actually create a, a set of that PY modules that uses that C++ function and now, whenever you want to essentially concatenate these things, you just call the function test xy. Just call the function test xy. What does it do? It just go and uh, call that C++ function and then uh, return the string for you. Of course, this is something that you could, you could do it in Python. You don't need C++ to do concatenate to a string. You can do it much easier in Python. But say that you want to do some computations and this computation is hard essentially. It takes very time consuming, it's very important. Then instead of this one, still you will send this, you, you have some numbers. These numbers, you will turn it into some strings. These strings will be given essentially to Py to C++. C++ takes these strings, makes to into numbers, and then do some complete some complex operations there. And then the results will be again some number, say the number will be turned into a string, return to your Python program, your Python program can. So this is a typical thing, and this is the one that, especially when you get the Python, uh, it tells you that <clears throat> uh, like the Python uh, thing is doing binding. This is the concept of binding that happens. These are gets C++ and Python, they will be put together such that you can run. So in some sense, this is another way that Python and C++ in your uh, like container, for example, they communicate with each other. But that is interesting. I mean, you can, if you know, we want to know more about it, you can search and know more about it. Uh, <clears throat> And I think the next thing that we want to uh, uh, talk about essentially is scraping uh, HTMLs in uh, Python. Great. Uh, wait. 
Now uh, let's continue with uh, like a scraping HTML in Python. As I mentioned, two ways to get the data, either through API, but API generally is the idea that if you are doing from API, the people don't give it for free. The idea that they are providing this service, after some time you need to pay them. Maybe at the beginning it is for, I don't know, for X number of API calls. API call are like get, post, or something like this. It might be different uh, limitations even for any of them. For a certain number, it might be free. After that, you need to pay them. And again, you might actually write some uh, um, server that provides such information for other than then charge people. However, the one that is more like free is the scraping HTML work. That needs a bit more work. But it, I mean, you need to write programs essentially and different HTML, they have different formats, et cetera. But if you can do that, generally this is something that you can get the data and possibly if you have enough data, you can sell this data to the other companies. So it is actually a good way of getting money. Yeah. yeah. I will talk about it. So there are two things essentially to do, uh, essentially install if you want to have a new thing. So like beautiful soap, if you want to install it, you can use a, a Kanta install. That, uh, yeah, this is essentially, um, I mean, Anaconda comes from this one, but you can, I mean, search more about it. There are two things, the Kanta install versus pip uh, install. Pip install, I mean, if you are in, uh, uh, in but this is used more essentially pip install if you are in Anaconda. The difference is that Conda install, it takes all the binary files and this uh, binary files will come. So it is somehow compiled file. As I mentioned, these are C++. So it gets the compiled files, the binary files and get it. The pip install actually brings the original file and compile it for you. There. So that's the main difference. I mean, both works. I use personally more uh, pip install essentially, but you can actually use Kanda install as well. And you can read more about it. But as I mentioned, the pip install get the actual code and then bind it essentially. Uh, Kanda install gets the binary objects and do that. Good. Now, you will get uh, essentially how can we handle this one? As I mentioned, HTML files are very hard to. Deal with. The only way is that you need to use actually the program and in particular beautiful so. So you may essentially import a request. A request, I think nowadays in your version of Anaconda, actually it might be already available. You don't need to, like request is there essentially. You don't install anything. But uh, you will uh, import uh, from beautiful soap BS4. So first you need to install it and then you will get it. This might be not the latest version, but this is just some version. Then from R, you get essentially the, for example, this is some website that, I mean, may still work actually. You may get this one. And then this, when you get our request that get, you get the HTML. Then in the, then what we do, you will say beautiful soap, our content. That gets essentially the root of this HTML at root. Now it gives you some capabilities. Uh, yeah, now at, uh, it gives you some capabilities, like, uh, for example, uh, in HTML, as we discussed, there is a div. The, these are the tags. So it says that you want to find a particular div, you say that root find in this HTML, a particular div that ID is a schedule. Then in this schedule, find the table, in the body of that, find the T body, and then find all. A. A, essentially, it is, uh, this is uh, all the links. So in HTML, we are using essentially A for the links section. So here is somehow finds all the links for you. So what is the idea? So let's talk about a particular project. So you want to go to this class, the website. Say you have Carpal Tunnel, you cannot, you want to get all the lecture notes, uh, all the PDF and uh, slides from the previous presentation of this class. Then what do you do? You will go and one way to go one by one click and then download all of them. You want to write a program that goes there and then essentially get all of them and then do the operations. How should we do that? That's the whole idea that we have tried to do it. 
So we want to write a program that goes, find all the relevant link. There may be lots of links, but we want to find the links to the PDF file or to the PPTX file for a slide. And those download it and then save it. Without, I, I just want to write the program such that it goes there and get it. That's essentially scraping the web core, the website of the course. <clears throat> This is the one that I have mentioned. So again, yeah, you want to go to the website, find get all the PDF or PPTX file. <clears throat> so this is the one that it finds all schedules. I mean, all the things essentially. This is the one that is used as schedule. But generally you need to do inspect the HTML file first, see what are the important things. You cannot just do write this scraping without actually write uh, without uh, Think the file. You need to go, for example, to Chrome, and then there is the inspect, and you will inspect, see what are the important parts of it. And then you will write these programs it's using beautiful stuff. And then, as I mentioned, this finds all the links for this. But you only want the PDF and PPTX files, not the all other files. There might be some other links there. This is the part that we want to use regular expressions. So. How can you find essentially all the files in the URL, list of all URLs that are essentially ending with a star .pdf or a star, like they are in the form a star PDF or a star PPTX? Python actually has a very strong set of uh, functions to deal with strings. And again, a string can be a very big file. You can consider the whole thing as a string. So there is no limitation in the size of the string. A whole big file you can, if you remember, we mentioned load s or load. Load s is just put everything in a very like a very big things as just one string. So you can have a very arbitrarily large string. And there are very uh, effective functions. So one of them is endvis. Endvis essentially says that this file name is a string, endvis dot pdf or dot pptx. That says that whether it ends with one of these that you can check. But what about if it is .ptf or .pptx, not all in the lower case? Then in that case, actually, the, the one that is very useful, again, lower. This lower is used a lot. Always you want to do it, just do it lower. Lower is sometimes it make it a standardized. So you want to make it first in a standard form, everything in the lower case, and then you can just check it with PDF and PDF. But we'll talk also about regular expression. There are two other things that it, it is very useful. Essentially, you can give a string s that a split. These two are also very useful. A, a split, essentially, you will give some character a, for example. It finds all the a's in this strings and then a split it. So that essentially those a part, if there is some a here, a here, a here. So Essentially, take the first one as the first element of the array. This is the second one. This is the third one and the fourth one. This is the way that you can actually give you an array, essentially, of the strings. Then there is another one. It is called, uh, you can say this array. Uh, that uh, was, uh, I think that was the, so this is the join operation. I think this is the format. You can shake essentially. And the join operation, you are uh, essentially uh, giving the things and joins all of these elements of this array into making the one string essentially. So this operation of a split and join are very important essentially because you can do lots of things. So you want to find all cases that a link is used, then just say a split all of them on the link. It finds the beginning of each of them, essentially the things. Then you can do your operation and you want to get the original string, you will just join everything together. Mm. I think this was something like the, if I remember, uh, yeah, this is like the join, I mean, maybe not the correct thing, I think that was something like A, that, uh, 
join. Yeah, it, it, so you can just search a split and join. I mean, the exact format that you can do it. But but a split in general, a split the string, make an array of the strings after the splitting and join, put all these strings together into one function. There is another one called uh, uh, replace that we will talk. Replace is essentially just uh, replace one string with the second string in the whole string that you. So in the, this string, you will say that s dot replace. Whenever you will find this string, just replace it. This so these are like end with replace, join, and split. These are three very important things. Even I will say a split, join, and replace is even more important actually than end with. That you can do lots of things here. So if you want to do just Python, you can do just Python. However, if you want to do it, you can do it with regular languages. You can do essentially more than that. So here you can just do it with Python. And this lore also is very important. Make everything lower and such that you can a standard form that you can do. Uh, why do we use it essentially regular languages? Mm. Because of this. So for example, you want to check that somebody comes and inter like you want to create a website. This is the typical thing. Say that you want to register, give my give an email address. So this email address, you just want to say, I mean, this is not a junk email. And you need to check that it is in the correct format of a, an email. This is some kind of regular expression to check all possibilities, say, to make sure that this email is in the correct format. Even if everything is correct, still that email might be not a valid. So the only way actually is doing this way that you will see it when you send an email, you will get an email there and you need to get a link and then you need to activate it. That's the reason that they are doing that. But you just want to make sure some uh, essentially um, uh, like hackers or scammers, they are not coming and just scam your website. Uh, how can you do that? The, only, the best way actually is to use this, uh, uh, this like you will write some expression like a regular expression, you can actually lots of them copy paste from the website like Stack Overflow, or you can get it from ChatGPT or, uh, for example, uh, Copilot. You can get it, and that is some standard. This is just make sure that this format that this person is writing is just like because yeah, sometimes if somebody asks me in some email, I just send something essentially and to just pass that. Screen. You just want to make sure that nothing like this happens and everything is valid. This is like the thing. So if you want to do more complicated thing, you need to actually do regular expressions. Now, what are regular expressions? Regular expressions are uh, essentially regular expressions are a language. So regular expressions, some language, generally this is a language or only maybe less complicated than compa uh, this essentially grammars. So grammars are a bit more complicated language. C++ or Python, these are grammars. You can actually, this is a language that you can ex express them by grammars. Regular expressions are also a language and this can be complicated, but a bit less complicated than uh, <clears throat> like grammars. And in general, I mean, uh, you can uh, you can with grammars you can uh, inter you can essentially represent more than regular expressions. But regular expressions are by themselves also complicated things, and you can read about them. Uh, so just search essentially, and you can. I will talk about some basics of regular expressions. But there are three things that we are talking about regular expression, which are important. So uh, the first one. Is the uh, there are three functions. So you will import and re regular expression. And then, uh, so there is one re.search. Re.search, it finds the first match of the this regular expression that is matched in your text. So for here, you will say that research r data 602. That data 602 will be found in your text. And then you can say print match dot start. It prints the index of the first occurrence of that. If you want to see essentially, uh, 
does the start of a text matches this data things? This is the read match. Read match just check whether the start of this text is matches this or not. Just the start. If you want to find all these iterations of this, like all matches of this, then you need to use find all. Find all finds all matches of this and then give you as essentially a list that you can iterate. There is another way also, you can uh, do this one. Uh, you can say, uh, this is another one, uh, find iterations. In the find iteration also, um, you say re find uh, iterate this one in the text. This gives you some iterators in Python. Again, these are some of the iterators that are you need to, uh, like iterators, decorators, something like this in Python, you should learn about it. This Python is not a simple language actually. Yes, you can do some basic stuff with that, but if you want to write, you can actually write very complicated programs in, in Python. And just using all this kind of object-oriented decorators, etc., and you should actually read about them. It takes time, essentially. I can. This is and this is not the class that we just teach about Python. We we'll talk some important things which are important for uh, data science, but the rest you need to do it yourself. Actually. It's a complicated language. Anyhow, so this one find iterate returns an iterator, and this iterator you can actually any iterator you can put a four, and then you say match that started prints the beginning of. Time. So these are the three important things essentially that regular expression, you can use it. But what about the regular expression themselves? So this R, this, what is the format of this? Here is just say data 602, that's a very easy one. Just matches this one. But matching actually, you can have matching multiple characters. And that's the meaning of essentially more advanced and like considering the regular uh, expression as a language. So uh, here, uh, if you want to, so you can match essentially with regular expression. You can match sets of characters or multiple or more elaborate sets and, of sequences and characters. This is some basic of that. If you want to match a particular character, just say A. So if you want to match it, just for example here, you want to match it data 602, just write it data 602. But you may want to do that. You want to match the character A, B, or C. You don't know which one of them, A, B, C. Then you will put it essentially on this uh, uh, thing, essentially bracket. If you want to say that match any character except A, B, C, then you will put this not inside. If you say match any digit, a slash D is doing that. A slash D is equal to 0, 1, 2, 3, 9, because this is or, as I mentioned. Or you can just say 0 to 9. If you want to match any alphanumerical, you will say a slash W. It means that A to Z, lower or uppercase, or zero to nine, or this underscore. You may just want to say white space. White space can be essentially tab, you know, end line, etc. This is the meaning of white space. If you want to match any characters, you will just put it to dot, means any character. If there are some of these special characters that you want to search for them, you need to put a space or escape essentially, and then you need to put backslash, and then you will put this special character. So if you want to match essentially dot, you need to put a space dash dot, or a dash, for example, this, etc. Now, also you can have some kind of a Python or other things, essentially, if you want to do some iterators, you want to say that how many of these characters is called common modifier. If you want to match exactly A, just write A. If you want to match exactly A, zero or one, you will say A, question mark. If you want to say match character A, zero or more times, you will say A star. If you want to say match character A one or more time, you will say A plus. If you want to say match A exactly n times, then you will say A n times. If you want to match exact character A at least n times, you will say A uh, essentially curly bracket n and then comma space and then close. 
For example, you want to match, you have a text essentially, or like a thing, you want to match all instances of university of somewhere, that this somewhere is an alphanumerical string with at least three characters. How can I do that? I will say that a slash s a star means that any space at the beginning. Then say the university, then you want to have a space, you will say a slash s. I mean, you don't, yeah, this is like escape, you don't need to. And then you will say of, again, a space. And then you want to say that any alphanumerical, which is at least three or more, you say slash W three or more. You can see lots of more details about these regular expressions are the thing that you can do again a lot. This is a language, it is like, I mean, you can do very complicated stuff essentially in regular languages. And this is a course that you can, Take it essentially, I think this is uh, some course that we have. It, it talk about regular languages at the beginning and the grammar that they So it's a complicated things, but uh, you can get lots of these things essentially. Like if you want to get for emails or something, you can just go to a Stack Overflow, search it, or like you can just do chat GPT and get the one. But this is essentially at least tells you how you can understand this. Even if you don't write it, you can read it. So sometimes you write a program, sometimes you at least you can read it that and understand it. It's like this for it. Another thing that is uh, very important, if you want to do the groups, the groups are so very important. If you want to know more than just, did we find a match or did we, where is the first match? So grouping essentially, it try to save essentially the it as the regular expression matcher to keep track to keep track of certain portions of the text such that you can just maybe you don't only care about this particular text and you want to keep this one the rest you want to ignore it that so in some sense gives uh, somehow saves this one in some variables that you can use these variables later. So for example here. Uh, here you want to say that, uh, uh, and how do you do that, the grouping? The grouping essentially, as I mentioned, some kind of part of the text that you care about it, and you can even give the explicit name to it. Or if you don't give the name, you can call it one, two, three, essentially, and gives you the group one, the group two, group two. For example, here the same thing. We have it the uh, slash s. Uh, then this is the one group, university. University, it can start with the capital or, non-capital, and then the university at the end. Then of, it can be of or of, any of them. And then the word can be at least three. So this is the regular expression. You will say R star this one, you will put it there. And then you will say research this. Then you search on this one, it, it matches this spring. But then how can you do that? You will say print M groups. Print M groups essentially gives the groups. So the first group, the first variable was university. The first one, it writes it. Then the second one was of, and the third one was merit. You can actually access to each of them. You can name the groups. So, uh, but sometimes essentially, as I mentioned, if you get longer ones, you want to give the names. So what is the name group? You want to give, this is essentially a variable that you will give a name. This is the way you will say that you will still use parentheses and then say question mark P and then you will give the name to that. Then later you can actually call that name and just do that. For example, here you say this is the regular expression, this is the same thing. And then you will give it to the school. So the last one is the school name. This is the name is the school. Then you will do search in it, it matches. And then what does it do? You will say M group a school. Only a school, you don't care about the other one is raised Maryland. Now, if you have this one, you could actually, uh, you made this the whole search, maybe you have it find all. If you have done it find all or find iterate, you can essentially find all of this, and then you can write all the university name that is on the search. All university of something prints all of this of part, the last part. Uh, so, uh, as I mentioned, if you want to replace something in uh, some string in Python, that is easy. You can just use a string. It is a powerful thing. So here, for example, A, B, C, A, B, thing, replace this. You will say replace A with X, essentially. 
So we just replace in this string all of this A with X. Uh, but also you can do this one in the regular expression. So if this is your text, you want to, in the text, you want to change any data science to Shema science essentially, Shema the Shmians. <laughs> then you will just write this regular expression, change it to this regular, regular expression in the text. Now in the text, I love introduction to data science is that I love introduction to uh, Shema the Shemians. You can also add grouping in it. How can we do that? You want to say that essentially re, uh, re this regular expression, substitute. Whenever you have the, so this is the, the first group, then the second group S thing and the science essentially the whole things. This one essentially, I'm not so sure that it is needed. So it says that, so I access to the first group by say uh, dash one. Dash one means the first group, whatever you found in the first group. Dash two means the second group. As I mentioned, you can give the explicit name or you can just call it dash one, dash two, dash, uh, sorry. Yeah, back at slash one, back at slash two ones. So here you said that this, uh, this one, the first three words that you found it, just write that one. Then the space you want to ignore, you don't want to write a space. And then the second one is S or C, use that one, and then change a science to Shemayans. So if you give, again, this data science thing, it changes it to this one. This is the same way of writing this change. Here we are using grouping essentially. Another thing that will be used a lot, the compile regular expression. What is this? Sometime, uh, this regular expression at the compile time that essentially try to match this. But if it's a regular expression that you want to use it for lots of things like email, etc., it might be faster if you compile this, because again, it's a language, you should compile it. You will compile it, then whenever you want to use it, then you can use it later. So as I mentioned, match means the start of the text is matching. Search, find the first match, and find all finds all of them. But if you, uh, this of course is very data thick, is very simple one. But it's like a, this kind of complicated things that we mentioned for uh, this one for this kind of regular expression. You may want to actually compile it. If you compile it, it makes it much faster to match it later. So, and now uh, let's essentially go to the project that we had. We want to go to the website. And from that website, we wanted to get all PDF and PTX and save them as a file. Let's say, how can we do that? Uh, good. So uh, first you will say import regular expression. Then you will say import request. Then you will import from like you get PS4 from beautiful soap. Then this is try expect. Try expect say that I mean if from URL parts import this. So if URL parts you can import it, you will import it. But if it is except there is some error there, then you get it from URL parts. So this is the different names that you can do it. This is the way you can just do it. You can do it other ways, but this is one way to do that. Is try and accept. You are using a lot essentially to get exceptions. Again, these are some of the things that you should know from Python and we are going beyond that. Then you want to get HTTP get request sent to the URL, this one. So you will go this URL.get, this is the URL of the course, whatever the URL, you will get this R. Then this R.content gives to root. Then you will, the same things we discussed, you will go to the division that has the, uh, this, div part that has a schedule as the ID, and then find the table and then find all the links. All the links now will be essentially in some iterators, which is links here. Now you can iterate over that. For links in links, you will get essentially href. Href essentially, it means that uh, link dot uh, uh, href part essentially, that is the uh, reference for that. Link essentially. So uh, 
so, so uh, href essentially is the reference that is uh, giving the final six and then what do we do there here if you want to check whether it is a pdf or pptx you can say that if href lower that end with dot pdf or dot ppx then what do you do then here url parse that url join it joins the url plus this href so this is the reference essentially that you will put it in the html file so for this reference it just join them makes a url then you need to request get this URL a stream equal to true. A stream equal to true essentially downloads that. Whenever I say a stream it, it means that download it essentially. It downloads everything and it would be in the RD. So essentially href essentially gets the name of the file. And then when you get the name of the file, then you will download the file. Now you need to save that file. So you will write the downloadable PDF or I mean the file into a file. You will do a, this is out file. You have some out base is your current directory. Plus href the name of that new file. That would be join, pass join, essentially join and make a pass for that. This is the out file. This is the essentially say C, C uh, column slash, uh, I don't know, directory for example, something else essentially. But that would be something like this. Maybe a slash essentially one dot PDF. This one created it would be the out file, would be this essentially the string. When you create this one, then you will say write open, you will open this file. Uh, you want to write in it as a binary file as a F, and then you will just write the rd.content. rd was the one, the content of that, you will write it in that file. You will do that, then essentially the PDF file or PPTX file, all will be saved in the directory that you want. That's the thing that you can do it. I mean, here, uh, here we have done everything with Python, but some part of it, you could actually do it uh, with uh, regular expression. As I mentioned, the string capability that you have it, especially join this concept of uh, uh, like a split, you will split it and then into array, then you will, then you have an array that you can put essentially four in it, whatever you want to do it. And at the end of the day, you can always join it to get another string. So this, uh, these two are very important as well as replace end with and lower. Uh, one other thing that I also wanted to say, so uh, this is uh, one interesting thing about, uh, like, for example, you may create a website. Uh, and this website, you might to ask everyone who want to register, uh, I mean, to access to your website, you can just give essentially some, you know, uh, some Gmail. With the regular expression, you can just make sure that this is uh, something that, I mean, this is a valid email. You cannot completely do that. Still, you need to send an email. You can actually read, just say, how can I send an email essentially in Python? You can get it from ChatGPT, you get the exact. Then you can send an email and that person should essentially give the link. You will give the link that clicks that make sure that this is actually valid. This is something that you can do it here. But this is just one, so if you don't do this, what is the problem is that some hacker or some essentially some person is, uh, some person who is writing the software, it may come and hack your server. One of the way to hack your server is by flooding. What's the meaning of flooding is essentially just come, they can write essentially some, some code like JavaScript code or others that they will come and just write random essentially emails for you. And then every time you just call your call your things and essentially put so many emails to just flood your server and essentially your server is just non-responsive. These are some of the things actually that uh, will be uh, very helpful if you are implementing this, for example, at Google App Engine. If you do that, Google has, you know, one of the probably the safest or most secure way of this. I have never heard that Google, some of this information by Google essentially gets lost. 
even the university is essentially changing some of this to the Google to Gmail because it's very hard to hack it. Google actually. And uh, one thing that is doing that, this type of hacking that the people try to hack your website, if you don't use cloud and you put it on your server, the people may do it, find a way and essentially make sure that your server is down and get some of the maybe sensitive information there. But if you put it at Google Cloud, the good thing is that Google is doing that. If from one address, it sees that there are several people are doing that, it does not completely kill it, just gives more delay to that thing. Uh, so uh, it is doing something called load balancing, essentially, in the app engine. This is some of the things that we can do it at Kubernetes. And make sure that from one IP, if you get so many requests, the first one, it may answer fast, but the second one has a delay. The third one has more delay. So in some sense, without killing that, it still responds to that. But maybe after fifth one, the delay is so much long that that website cannot do any, that hacker cannot do anything because... Like it needs to uh, wait a lot to hear even the first one, does not allow that enter the sixth email anymore. Yeah. This is the way that, uh, like for example, clouds are very good also for security issues and you can do that. So we were talking about the uh, uh, Gmail as I meant for the email. So you can check, you can always consider this fact that as I mentioned, the person who is running and talking with your server is it's some kind of thing you may say it's compromised essentially, some compromised HTML or JavaScript talking to. And this, I mean, it might be a hacker, but if you do it on the cloud, generally you have a much safer environment and Google or AWS or others, they are checking some of this. Good. So then after this, we talk about the, this basic ML, then we talk about data collection and loading in particular, two approaches. One essentially about uh, this. Uh, like API and the other one is essentially scraping. No, no, I'm saying, okay, how can we model and manipulate this data that we have downloaded? So actually one definition of data science is that manipulating and computing on a data, which is very large, but somehow is in a structure, but it's not completely like that, even like big HTML files that you are getting. Yes, it has some structure, but it can be very messy. There are several tools that we have mentioned here, like Beautiful Soap and others that we have discussed that, but there are lots of others outside that you can. Uh, so here also I wanted to, I, I think I mentioned this one, I, but I want to emphasize again, this imperative coding versus the sequence or pipelines of operations. So as I mentioned, this kind of, when you try to write a simple program, you will get the input, you will write the program to do some computations and then you will give the output. But when you are talking about this kind of whole, like Google Maps or other things like Amazon or other things, these big things, these are actually is a sequence or pipelines of operations on the data. So as I mentioned, this is, like, this is written in a very <clears throat> distributed way that you will ask uh, essentially Google Maps, it goes to find from some database, give some information and then ask some sequence. Then they said that, okay, this other program should run now to calculate or update your path from here to, for example, I-20. And this should be done every one second. So this is essentially a sequence of programs, as I mentioned, microservices that are written. So it is a much more uh, like essentially complicated way Sometimes these small microservices, you need to write those code. Those might be more like this kind of imp uh, imperative codes that you will write it in C++ or Python. But sometimes these are just some packages that you are using. Uh, so in that sense, maybe as a data science, you don't, you are not a software engineer. You are not writing C++ code. You are just using some of this that is already written. But still you need to, I mean, understand uh, quite well how you can put them together essentially. Uh, such that uh, when you put uh, this one, one after others, essentially it works. And if it does not work, you need to do debugging. Debugging means that essentially the debugging is very similar in imperative coding or sequence pipelines. Of so that was essentially some ideas about this. Uh, as I mentioned, this they have some kind of shift thinking from imperative code, a small one, to very complicated distributed way, lots of microservices, and lots of operations that you should do it one after the other. Some of them, again, this program, you need to write it down. 
uh, as an imperative code. Each of them is a small non-imperative code, but sometimes you have them and you want to put them together, but then still you need to debug. <clears throat> Okay, so this is the thing. So next time we are talking about some basic, essentially, uh, data representations. We talked so, so far they get the data, and then you want to manipulate it. To manipulate it, you need to see what type of data you have and what are the things, the operations that you have. In, in particular, with NumPy or SciPy, we will talk more about them. Uh, but that would be essentially for the next session that we will talk more about this stuff.